So we'll now move on to the first session today, upstream design and manufacturing. This is a session mainly concerned with the design of new battery chemistries, devices, and the manufacturing and monitoring of batteries. So our first speaker of the session is Professor Yan Yao. Professor Yao comes to us from uh, comes to us today from the University of Houston and will be speaking about chemistry design for transition metal free batteries. Please take it away when you're ready, Yan. Sure. Uh... Let me share my screen. Okay, great. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me and uh, really appreciate the opportunity to share our work on the theme of the design, safe and sustainable future. Um, the type of battery I'm going to talk today that uh, we have been working on for several years is the all solid state-based organic sodium batteries. So this shows the structure of the battery. Uh, in contrast to traditional you know, battery made using some organic based uh, electrolyte, polymer electrolyte. In this case, actually we use a ceramic electrolyte and we use organic as a redox active material. So one of the benefits of doing that is that actually we found it can uh, form a conformal interface. Well, during the battery char char charge and discharge process that's uh, uh, you know, uh, without a uh, crack or uh, conformal interface. So uh, the second part I'm going to talk about today is uh, the interface about anode and the uh, solid electrolyte, uh, where we uh, found the uh, user sodium metal as uh, as anode materials. Uh, and uh, we found the new type of oxy sulfide based glass electrolyte can really uh, suppress the sodium dendrite formation and improve the stability. So, uh, so this battery um, is the early stage. Uh, but we are uh, hoping to address this uh, uh, sustainability issue uh, without using abundant, uh, with without using critical metals, and uh, uh, also potentially safe. Now, um, batteries hold the key to a clean energy future. Um, globally, now more than fifteen percent of passenger vehicles are based on uh, EVs, and uh, this trend will continue. And last year, uh, more than 40 million cars has been uh, uh, sold uh, globally, and uh, more than 40 million cars is uh, on the road right now. So this really calls for terawatt scale manufacturing and the production. Uh, current leasing and batteries rely on nickel and the listen and the cobalt, and those critical elements are in short supply. Um, so we have been thinking about, is there any possibility to move from this transition metal-based oxide gas material to potentially organic-based materials with only carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen as the key elements? Um, so we call the transition metal-free gas materials. Also, can we replace the listen with more abundant metal, such as um, sodium, magnesium, zinc, and other uh, trivalent metal like, such as aluminum. Now, this really presents opportunities for organic electrical material for energy storage. If we look at uh, some life cycle of this organic-based uh, electrical materials, some of them can be uh, synthesized from a petroleum uh, uh, product or from a biomass. And the refinery and the processing, we need to think about uh, recycle for this type of batteries with uh, advantage compared to uh, current leasing and batteries. And um, there, the beauty of the organic materials is that we have a spectral variation, really can provide opportunities. Um, for example, uh, in, in this review, chemical review paper, we really compare uh, organic, uh, different type of organic materials with inorganic side by side, uh, such as the black, uh, you know, inorganic based cancer materials. Uh, in fact, you know, many of the organic materials has the material level and density comparable to the inorganic. Um, uh, some of the known materials, the green show here, uh, have the material you know, energy density more than one, you know, 800 to 1,000 watt-hour per kg. And also we have organic sulfur batteries, you know, higher cap uh, capacity and lower voltage, and P-type some radical-based polymers have a higher voltage, a little bit lower capacity. So, uh, but the real challenge is how do we integrate 
this um, organic material into a device that at, to enable her device level or cell level um, energy density. Um, so another beauty of the organic resource material is that they are not sensitive to particular chitons uh, because this you know, charge balancing uh, uh, compensation mechanism. Uh, for example, this quinone-based materials, it can be reversibly reduced and oxidized and uh, almost any cation can be used to uh, compensate the charge, such as lysine, sodium, magnesium, zinc. So you does not have to redesign new host material uh, for different cation. So the key challenges for organic materials, some of the reaction intermediates are soluble in the li traditional liquid electrolyte, therefore leading to capacity decay. So typical uh, 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 reflecting the short cycle life. So one idea is can we combine the organic material with solid state batteries? Uh, for example, this from uh, Professor Poyser's group, um, they show this molecule for the TMQ, is tetramethyl oxy benzoquino. They go through a two electron reaction, can very high capacity over 200. Um, so they actually uh, work with uh, blue solutions um, to replace the LP uh, with this organic molecule and they use a PEO based uh, solid electrolyte uh, you know, to form a uh, cell, solid state cells. Um, here's the device performance compared to uh, traditional carbonate based liquid electrolyte, this solid state electrolyte uh, perform much better, twice higher capacity. Um, but you know, the combined cycling stability uh, you know, is improved compared to liquid, but uh, actually PEO uh, has become a li slightly liquid uh, softened at the higher temperature. So we still see capacity decay. Um, our question is, can we use combined organic materials with a really ceramic-based solid electrolyte? And but in our case, in the last few years, we have been working mainly working on sulfide-based solid electrolyte. Uh, we have also worked with oxide, you know, and other halide-based uh, new type of solid state electrolyte. Um, what's the key changes for all solid state sodium batteries? Um, the main change is really relies on chemical mechanical instability of the cathode sulfide interface. Um, that's, you know, in many cases, they have chemical reaction uh, because the sulfide has a limited electric chemical window. Uh, in many cases, they have a mechanical contact loss you know, because volume change, they have a crack and the contact loss therefore require a higher um, pressure, stepping pressure. Um, also, in sometimes they have irreversible uh, resistive layers at the cathode electrolyte interface. Uh, then limited any conductive coating can be developed for sodium. Um, so on the anode side, um, you know, this sodium metal and the solid electrolyte, they are not stable. Just contact them for a few hours, 10 hours or 100 hours without even, with very small current density cycling, you can see the electrolyte turns to black. So intrinsically, they are chemical on, on, on incompatible. So um, part of the reason is that the re reaction product is electronic conductive. So therefore, enable you know uh, continual reaction with time. Um, so one one idea is to really block in the interface with the electron insulating interface materials, and this could also lead to a sodium dendrite growth at the insert. Sorry, actually. So facing these two challenges, our group, uh, uh, you know, in 2018, uh, uh, founded by Apa E project, we first report using uh, organic cathode materials uh, in the cathode composite. Now we also need to combine with uh, sodium phosphate sulfide. This is a solid electrolyte conducting sodium ion, right? Uh, different from liquid electrolyte, where you do not need to mix. Uh, you know, you require liquid electrolyte to infiltrate to the Castle, but in the solid state, uh, you have to pre-mix the uh, ion conducting phase into the castle. So this materials we chemically synthesized by you know association as this purple compound. This actually uh, called a rhodonate, you know, sodium rhodonate, rhodonate, you know, from the uh, bio uh, plant, and that can be uh, synthesized large scale. 
And uh, we show this material is actually is quite stable you know, within the electrochemical window of the solid electric line. And, uh, uh, you know, so compared to uh, most inorganic uh, cancer materials, this really shows the advantage of high utilization, higher capacity, uh, because their electrochemical window is right within the stability window of the solid electric line. So we demonstrated uh, um, for the first time very nice uh, cycle instability, uh, you know, over 150. This is a two electron, two sodium reaction for this compound. So later we moved to a, you know, a different organic compound called the PTO. This is a tetratetrotone um, pyrazine. Uh, you know, uh, so uh, this is uh, four electron, four carbonyl groups for a sodium reaction. So this uh, give you uh, over, you know, uh, close to 400 milliamp of a grand capacity and over two volt. So we also show this, you know, uh, very stable um, at the earliest stage can cycle over 500 cycles. So we look into this mechanism why this is potential better um, compared to, um, you know, so we found that this, you know, compared to uh, in, in organic materials, they are, uh, they, after a couple of cycles, you know, they have a crack in the interface, and uh, also that's why they require very high stacking pressure. We found in this case, you know, organic says we have a much better interface, and uh, uh, you know, even up two hundred cycles. So this has to do with the mechanical properties of the organic materials. They are highly malleable, uh, so their hardness is uh, from two gigapascal compared to ten gigapascal of the NMC. Uh, therefore, they actually can deform and uh, uh, form conformal interface uh, even during the cycling. Uh, we actually, our group developed in situ SEM to look at our pendle, uh, um, what, how does this, you know, divide, uh, cancel particle volume uh, involved during a charge discharge process. And uh, here is one uh, example that, you know, in the MC system, we see the uh, cancel during charging the actually expand and may form a crack in the interface as a, inside the MC particles. But the organic materials, uh, so we actually see there's you know, almost no crack formation. Uh, you know, they're similar to the capacity. And we can track all these particle, individual particles, and uh, uh, compare organic and inorganic. We actually can answer the question, how much the volume change? And actually, it turns out to be about five percent uh, similar, uh, you know, in the organic uh, cases. So, but we didn't see any cracking formation there. So, um, we also, you know, able to study, uh, you know, one of, in solid state battery, one key issue is a couple of chemical mechanical properties, and uh, um, so we we actually using the, uh, you know. Design a tool that combine nano uh, nano indentation and uh, top seams, so we are up, able to study the interface in the organic solid electric uh, systems. You know, we this bring up the interface to the chemical reaction products, and uh, we are able to um, measure the nano indentation of mechanical properties as well for the same sample, and uh, you know, so that we can actually produce a map. Uh, for same sample correlate with uh, uh, chemical composition and its uh, mechanical uh, modules and the hardness right, in the same sample, so we have a much better understanding how this can be, you know, uh, coupled to design better batteries. Um, so, yeah, so softness can be over double edge of salt. Um, you know, this basically this indicates the microstructure in the battery is very important. Um, this, we also develop a solution process to really modify the microstructure so that we can further improve the utilization of the active material at a higher um, mass fraction, right? To really improve the device level, cell level, and its density. So I still have uh, about two minutes. I would also quickly talk about the anode side, the, the challenges. Uh, one of the challenges that, you know, and no, you know, sorry, lateral uh, reactivity uh, and the sodium grows into the dendrite to the brain boundaries. What we found in this, you know, major communication paper is that with very fine chemical com composition control, 
we can uh, in, enable this oxy sulfide based soil electrolyte with improved electrochemical stability with sodium metal. They form very, very thin and dense and self limiting interface. And this solid electrolyte itself is a dense, fully dense glass microstructure. Um, so, yeah, so this is a, a 3D reconstruction of this electrolyte. A glass electrolyte is almost 98% uh, dense compared to with oxygen. Um, it's 85% dense. And the quality of the electrolyte here is critical for the stability of solid state batteries. And this can be produced at room temperature, just with four milli, without need to go to the modern state or the typical glass uh, manufacturing, and uh, can be fully densified at a very high, low pressure. Um, so I would not go to the details, but we, it's even stable with sodium metal, uh, molten sodium. Um, so with the traditional NPS soil electrolyte, you form the porous interface. Uh, which is non ideal, uh, very thick. With this MPSO based solid electrolyte, the interface is only 1.5, 1.4 micrometer, uh, very thin and uh, oscillating interface with sodium metal. And uh, we show that, you know, by combining this tri layer structures, we are able to demonstrate uh, you know, critical current density about 2.3 mm. Uh, that's um, the highest with the sulfide based. Uh, solid electric system with sodium metals. So, um, so basically, I will conclude my talk saying that good is there's a strong need to discover new materials for beyond the design line batteries, and that can be domestic produced at a big scale or terawatt -watt scale. And uh, organic materials are soft and malleable, uh, form a conformal castle interface, and uh, uh, you know, we also develop strategies to manipulate the hardness to construct right microstructures. Um, this minor, minor composition difference, very small difference can affect the overall uh, properties of the SEI and the interface. So with that, I would uh, like to thank my um, team members and my collaborators and my founding agencies. Uh, I would uh, stop here and uh, I'd like to uh, answer the questions in the later discussion, final discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jan. That was a really interesting discussion on some alternative battery chemistries, and I'm sure we'll follow up on some of those points during our panel discussion later. Our next speaker in the session is Dr. Franco Zanotto, a postdoctoral researcher from the University of Picardie Jules and CNRS. Dr. Zanotto will be speaking about advanced uh, numerical models and AI for optimizing battery manufacturing processes. Please go ahead, Franco. Okay, thank you. I hope you can hear me and, and listen to and see the presentation. Um, so thank you so much for the invitation. I'm excited to, to, to talk to you about the activities of, of our group and how they relate to numerical simulations and artificial intelligence to, for the design of uh, electrodes and design and uh, batteries. So um, this is our group. I hope I can, yes. Uh, all these excellent people have uh, are working intensely on this. We have recently wrapped up the ERC funded artistic project. This is a five year project focused on the digitalization of manufacturing of battery cells and electrodes, focusing on lithium ion batteries. And the idea is to address the problem with uh, physics-based simulations and uh, machine learning or artificial intelligence uh, tools. Um, I'm a postdoc in the group. Um, Professor Alejandro Franco is the principal investigator. So just to introduce a little bit on this, you know that lithium ion batteries are uh, complex systems. They are composed of two electrodes, which in the micrometer scale, they are, um, they are, uh, let me get the pointer. They are composed of the, of tightly connected the different materials and the way in which these materials are, are connecting to each other uh, is what gives the electrode its energy, its line time, uh, some of, the, of its safety properties, and so also something that interests us today, sustainability and recyclability properties. In turn, this, uh, this micrometer structure 
is uh, determined by the whole and very complex process of manufacturing, right? It's a complex process because it uh, takes place in several steps in which each step is the result, uh, is uh, applied on the output of the previous step. And also in each one of these steps, we add uh, additional manufacturing parameters. So it becomes a very quickly a very complex process. And if we try to, to optimize this uh, through trial and error, we will end up with a lot of time and uh, money lost and a lot of scrap rates, uh, 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 high scrap, scrap rates and high waste, right? So these are very complex process and you, if we want to, to optimize it and make it more efficient and sustainable, we can think of approaches that, uh, of different approaches. One of these, which is very, uh, is rising in popularity right now is the use of digital twins. So the idea is to have a, a manufacturing line or a pilot line such as this one, which runs in parallel with a digital twin. And this is just a copy of the real world in uh, in the digital world, of course, which is constantly being fed with with sensors, with data that come come from from sensors in the in the real pilot line, and it can uh, imitate all of the processes that occur in the physical world. It can also uh, potentially take decisions and this uh, on how to modify the physical process to improve the the result and uh, give instructions to actuators that act on the pilot plant or manufacturing plant, plant in such a way that, as to optimize in real time on the fly the, the process. This, this would potentially reduce uh, scrap rates. It would make the whole process more efficient and sustainable. So the physical based models and artificial intelligence models come into play as the brain of this digital twin, right? And this is where the artistic project comes in. This, uh, the idea here is to use uh, these three, three legs of the project, right? Physics-based models, which is basically to go uh, a way to go from the physical laws that we already know and we know how to describe to experimental properties that we can measure in the, in the lab. To use also machine learning or also called um, data-driven models, which is just um, advanced statistics. We can think of them as advanced statistics that um, correlate the input manufacturing parameters with output properties. And then um, to um, use real experiments to both validate the, the physics-based models and to provide training data for machine learning models. So I will briefly talk about these physics-based models to, to, to let you know, to introduce the topic and then move on to how the artificial intelligence models use these results from physics-based models to generate, um, to, to optimize the process. Basically, uh, in order to, to we have a, for each one of the stages in the real manufacturing process, we have a digital twin of each step. So the first step is the slurry, is uh, the mixing of the of the components of what will become the electrode later into a suspension, which is a slurry, which is composed of several materials such as uh, conductive additives, polymer binders, a solvent to disperse everything, and active material particles. And we describe this whole system in terms of two different particle types. One is uh, the, the real active material particle, um, which respects the size of the experimental part of it. And another one is a fictional particle that takes into account the presence of the, all the remaining components, including the solvent. And we, we describe the evolution of the system according to a molecular dynamics-like approach. So we, we call it coarse grain molecular dynamics approach following a uh, uh, force field potential that uh, is a combination of a Hertzian potential and a, a Lennard-Jones potential. In this way, we allow the system to reach an equilibrium and uh, we can obtain a structure such as this one in periodic boundary conditions that can tell us information about the real system. For example, such as uh, density or, or viscosity, we can obtain these properties from the simulation. When we obtain these properties, we can change the input parameters to 
to fit these properties to the real experimentally measured ones. And we call this process fitting. And once we correctly describe the, the real system with these force fields, we can um, ensure that we are that these equations that we have here correctly describe the system. And we can now have a system that is described, a slurry that is described in, in this way with molecular dynamics like a punch. This uh, solvent that the system contains is later evaporated. So we have a model for the drying process as well. I told you that these fictional particles contain the solvent, so we can reduce them in size to account for the for the evaporation of the solvent, which occurs in, in an oven in the real world. And uh, we allow again the system to reach equilibrium in order to obtain a smaller structure that also contains the active material particles joined by a, a medium, which is a, a conductive and it's a binder, which holds everything together. And it also is a porous structure. This porosity is important because it allows the, the flow of lithium ions through the, the electron uh, when the battery is uh, working. Finally, this dry structure has to be compressed. We call this process calendaring. And uh, to, in, to increase the contact between the different components. The, the problem here is that the, this compression cannot be too much because we need to allow for the lithium movement of, within the pores to occur. So this is already giving us a, 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 a parameter that we will need to optimize, right? We, we have to find a sweet uh, spot, a compromise between compressing too much and compressing too little. And this is where artificial intelligence tools will, will come in. Just to describe a little bit of what happens in this process, it's not the same to apply low pressure or high pressures on the system. Uh, the system will react differently. And in, in both cases, the, the response of the system is a mixture of an elastic and a plastic deformation. So it's not so straightforward to assume that the porosity will decrease linearly with the, the pressure applied. So we need to also make sure that the experiments fit with the simulations in, this, in these cases. Um, now, just to, to tell you about how we use these physics-based models to uh, optimize. So the idea is to find the correct manufacturing parameters that will give us the desired properties in the end. And these properties can be in terms of performance, or it can also be in terms of uh, longer life cycles or better recyclability and so on, right? So one example, uh, I will show two examples of how we have done this. So we, we can take this physics-based approach that I was uh, telling about before. The problem with it is that it's very time consuming. So uh, we cannot run simulations on the fly uh, uh, in real time with the, with the experiment, but we can use uh, some, sort of smartly, uh, some sort of way of smartly defining the, the parameter space that we want to explore. In this case, we did it with three, with, as an example for a proof of concept, with three parameters. We can design a, a set of experiments, digital experiments, to explore this parameter space. And then we can run the simulations and we can obtain the electrode properties. Now, with using some sort of uh, machine learning, in this, in this case, it's called the deterministic learning, is the CISO approach. We can link these manufacturing parameters to the output properties directly in a way that's much, much faster. Now that we have this uh, new model, which is statistical, we can call it, it's database, uh, and it's much faster, we can uh, use it to obtain, uh, to perform optimization, for example, or run every, any kind of simulation that we want to, to do. First of all, we need to make sure that the model is actually predicting what we intend it to predict. So we have to compare predicted values by this uh, machine learning based model to the real values which come from the physics based simulation. So if all the, these points fall uh, within this diagonal line, that means that the prediction gets close to the real values. And uh, so now we have, with this plot, we can make sure that we have a, an accurate prediction. The difference is that this prediction is much, much faster than the physical based model. So this is the perfect substitute. We now have a much faster model, which with any kind of optimizer, such as a Bayesian optimization process, 
we can uh, use to find the maximum of, of a certain function. And in this case, this function will define the way we want to, in which we try to, to obtain the maximum beneficial properties and the minimum um, properties that we want to minimize, right? So we will have, we can try to optimize for large active surface, large conductivity, higher density, and low thrust. This uh, Bayesian optimis optimizer can give us the perfect, uh, the, the optimal parameters that will allow us to reach a maximum, an optimum for these properties. It's important to, to mention here that we're optimizing for four different parameters at the same time, which is, we will give us a different result if we care only about a single parameter. For example, if we want a high conductivity, which we know is a, is a positive parameter for batteries, we will not ob obtain such good values for, for the other parameters, right? So we, ha we have to take into account several different parameters according also to the objectives of, of the, that we want to, to apply these batteries for, right? It's not the same according to each uh, function in the real world potentially for these batteries. Now, what I have described here are the four different parameters that are related to the microstructure of the of the of the battery, but uh, what about its chemical its its electrochemical performance, right? Or even if we have uh, electrochemical performances that are better for different applications, some applications might require high power, and some applications might require high energy density. So we can analyze this by performing on top of the same uh, data set that we had before, based on physics-based simulations. We can perform uh, electrochemical simulations with a simple p 2 z model. And we can obtain all of the discharge curves for these, uh, these structures that we have performed before. With the same deterministic learning approach, we can now connect two different measures that we, that we, that we are interested in. One represents the energy density and the other one represents the, the power density of the system. And we can obtain the best possible manufacturing parameters according to the intended result, right? First, we have to, of course, make sure that the, the predictions are accurate the same way before, as before. We have made sure of that. And we can now use the same optimization approach as before, but focusing on different uh, goals, right? What, we, what if we have a, need high power rates, high, high discharge rates uh, capacities or low discharge rates capacities? The optimization process will give us different results, different parameters that we have to try for each condition, but we are able to obtain a, a perfect point for each one of these uh, optimization points. Now, uh, these were just two simple examples of how we can use this optimization, this machine learning, this physical based model approach coupled with artificial intelligence uh, optimization and uh, applied for, uh, in this case, an optimization of three different parameters in the, in the input and two or four uh, parameters as an output. But in principle, in this digital twin, we can expand it in any way as we, uh, that we want. So we could, in principle, include, for example, life cycle assessment uh, um, analysis or any sort of description for the emissions or the recyclability of the system, and we can optimize for that. So we can optimize for performance, but also to reduce the waste, to increase life cycle, uh, recyclability, or lower emissions. Um, as, uh, as I was saying, this is just a proof of concept that shows that this can potentially be used for many other approaches. So with that, I would like to, to finish my presentation and thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Frank, for, for a really nice talk. You know, I think uh, artificial intelligence is certainly an interesting area that the world's moving towards and would be excited to hear a bit more about this in the panel discussion. So our next speaker is Dr. Jenny Baker. Dr. Baker is a senior lecturer at Swansea University and today she will be presenting on sustainable battery manufacturing. So Franco, if you wouldn't mind, stop sharing. And yeah, Jenny, please go ahead when you're ready.
Hello, has that come up okay? Yeah, all great, thanks. Is that fair enough? Is that in the slideshow version? It's not in slideshow yeah. mode yet. Yeah. It's now okay. in presenter mode where we can see sort of everything else on the side, sorry. So you can see everything now. Um... Okay. Yep, that's perfect. Thank you. Right. Okay, so my name's uh, Jenny Baker. I'm the battery storage lead for Specific, which is um, developing um, sustainable buildings and, and the technologies that we need for sustainable buildings uh, led by Swansea University. And I'm going to talk about what we're doing in, in terms of sustainable manufacturing for batteries and looking at it from the concept of grid scale storage. So obviously there's many different applications for batteries from small devices to um, mobility to stationary storage. And there's overlap between those and there's different demands on each of them. So whereas energy density and um, cost may be important in vehicles, and, and again, there's overlap with that, that the energy density is less important in the uh, stationary storage, but cost certainly still is important. And also things like building regulations, different parts of the world, you've got different regulations in terms of what batteries you can use, as particularly in residential buildings. And when we're talking about um, material, well, sustainable manufacturing, obviously you need to consider the whole life cycle and Magda set this up really nicely from materials extraction um, to then the materials that you're going to use in your manufacturing, battery use and end of life. And then will you recycle them? Does anything go back into that loop to create a circular economy? And the three parts there are in red are what I'm going to focus on for this talk, because you can have sustainable manufacturing, but linking to how that battery is used um, is really important. And particularly in um, stationary storage, where you've got a choice about how it's used, whereas if you've got a vehicle's usage, it, it, that's all up to the customer, really. Whereas with stationary storage, you do want to use it optimally because your point is to, to save money and, and to provide yourself um, power. So, again, following up with from Magda's, look, you want to look at lots of different things in life cycle assessment. And in our point, when we've been looking at sustainability, we haven't considered the socioeconomic um parts of that, that that create that, although that's an additional part that we can look at. But we've really focused on the technical um, sides of that. So climate change emissions, so that's typically CO2, um, ozone depletion and formation, um, a whole raft of different things. But one of the key things that um, we see when we look at um, uh, renewable technologies in general is that obviously the whole focus on them, although global warming potential or, or the amount of CO2 emitted during manufacturing and, and use is not the only thing that's important. It's often the reason for moving to renewable technologies, and that's why it gets so much focus. And obviously the idea is that this should be reducing our, our CO2 emissions. That's the whole driver of it. And what we often see is that while... Um, Many of the impacts are sort of um, less fixed in terms of whether we've got renewable energies or not. One thing that renewable energies often do, and this term that includes wind, solar, and then energy storage to save those intermittent renewables, is that material resource scarcity goes up. And you can see this quite nicely from this grid looking at the European electricity scenario. So we're looking, this is actually 2018, so it's slightly out of date now. Um, but we're looking at um, the emissions to create um, one kilowatt hour of electricity um, through the UK grid. So you can see that the global warming emissions for um, gas-produced electricity are very high, and as you'd expect, renewables are lower. 
storage technology, then uh, whether it's hydro or stationary storage here, um, sorry, I'll just put my pointer on. Um, stationary storage here is that you can see that these are higher than the renewables, particularly the wind, because you're actually storing that energy. So you have to look at what the lost energy is in the round trip efficiency, as well as the impact of creating that battery and having it there to store energy when you need to. So we've made an improvement there, but when we look at the materials resource impact, what we see is that stationary storage here, um, this is lithium iron phosphate storage, is uh, much, much higher compared to just burning gas. And that's why we need to focus so much on the materials um, when we're doing these studies and when we're looking at, you know, which are going to be the batteries of the future. So um, one piece of work that we do and, and that we work with in, in specific is that we've got demonstrator buildings on site. And this means that we've got a huge amount of data from looking at our buildings, looking at um, whether we're generating electricity from PV on the roof or whether we're taking grid scale electricity. And we can monitor that over a huge, um, long time. This building has been running since 2018. And what we can see is that depending on how we operate the battery depends actually on its environmental impact. So here you've got these two that I've just put out uh, from the previous slide. We've got global warming potential, so how much CO2 is released. You can see that if we take it from photovoltaics on the roof, it, it's very low. The SIGS technology, which is quite low global warming impact. If we take grid electricity, it's higher. Then depending on how we operate the battery, we can actually make things worse by storing the electricity. If we store high carbon electricity and then we have a round trip efficiency where we're losing some power, we can actually um, make things worse. So we really do have to look at how we're operating the batteries um, as well as just what, how we've manufactured them. And the same is true with the materials resource. You've got the opposite thing here that your solar PV is much higher impact compared to your grid and the battery storage is somewhere in the middle. So I just put this slide in because this, this came up in the press very recently and I think it ties back uh, both to Magda and Franco's talks that the current battery manufacturing uh, routes are incredibly complex. They require huge numbers of different parameters that we don't fully understand how they all fit together. And battery manufacturing is happening in China. We're then, if we're to bring new plants uh, into the Europe and, and the UK, we need to make sure that we're competing with them, which means that we have to have the same levels of control, the same thicknesses um, and the same performance of, of those batteries. And therefore, at startup, this can be incredibly painful. And I think Franco's work is fantastic here looking at how we can reduce some of that pain. This headline suggesting 90 percent. I think not everywhere it is that bad, but it really is a, a key issue when we come to who's going to make the next generation of plants and, and especially when you're coming from behind in terms of manufacturing experience. And I'd just like to sort of share this. So this is um, a very simple experiment, that some work we did um, on looking at hard carbon anodes and just looking at the series resistance of them. And often when we see, we don't always see enough error bars in, in papers and I would put a, a task out to please, you know, let's see repeats and see what's happening with, with work because this will really help us when we move to manufacturing to understand, you know, is a process actually repeatable because sometimes a lower performance but that's repeatable is, is much more attractive to us as manufacturing engineers. And this actually completely ties in with what Franco was saying about the, um, the speed of mixing and the mixing being really important because here we saw a nice trend. If we add more carbon back, we get a higher, resi lower resistance of, of our uh, anode material, not looking at any of the other parameters in, in this state now. Yet when we increase the, the mixing speed, actually we see that that carbon black um, is no longer having the effect that we expected it to have. And we also we have a tighter distribution. So it's really important, even if you're a chemist, to sort of at least quantify uh, and the um, 
manufacturing parameters that you're using because that will really help uh, the next generation of manufacturing engineers or the, or the next step uh, in order to put those into production. Um, I'm conscious of time, so in terms of manufacturing, there's a huge number of different areas that we can look at to make things more sustainable. But what I'm just going to uh, look at really is this final one, which is the architecture. And what if we made the batteries completely differently? And this brings back a, a technology that isn't particularly suitable for mobility applications, although in, initially there were some ideas that people could fill up an, an electrolyte tank for a flow battery in vehicles, but I think that, that has moved on now. But they are particularly suitable for um, long duration storage and they have long lifetimes. So if we're looking at sustainability, yes, we want to recycle end of life, but the important thing is that that battery is in um, use for as long as possible. And often we can use things such as the zinc bromide batteries that we've got in our active classroom um, that um, are less susceptible to issues with fire. One of the disadvantages is because of the pump nature, that the need that you've got a pump running all the time, you can have lower round trip efficiency. The lower energy density is less important in buildings. And we've done some work with Sheffield University looking at modelling how these are used. And if you can set them up um, in a modular system as opposed to single large uh, batteries, you can actually reduce uh, the impacts of, of some of those lost efficiencies. And the cost does really depend on the situation, how often you're charging and discharging. So um, that's still out there and they're still at much lower volumes than typical lithium ion uh, phosphate batteries. And therefore, it's very difficult to compete when you're comparing those sorts of scales. But they certainly do have some potentials in cost and are being used more in grid scale storage. What we looked at in terms of sustainable manufacturing is similar to the zinc bromide, but this is um, an aqueous lead flow battery um, developed. This, this is um, a prototype that's been developed in ISC Bangalore, where they were looking, they've got a big tank of um, electrolyte under here, and this is a, I think about a half kilowatt hour um, flow cell. And we did a full life cycle assessment modeling, looking at the raw material extraction, the energy needed, and then the emissions as well coming from manufacturing that. And what you can see here is we've done the life cycle assessment here, concentrate on the red box. Um, so we're just looking at a few things, but the yellow is the material depletion potential that I've shown you. It's very low in all of them um, because the material is used for this technology. And the global warming potential um, is quite high, but what we showed during the life cycle assessment, we were able to work with um, the team to look at what things would help them reduce some of their impact. And um, you can see here, this is typical for most um, flow batteries, is that almost 70% by mass is their electric, and that does have some egg advantages at end of life because it means that you've got a big tank of the majority um, of your uh, materials that can easily be sort of separated out and regenerated and uh, going back into a new battery. I'd then just like to compare so we settled on the um, best option here and the material depletion is much lower than even the sodium ion battery here. Global warming potential is higher but that is informed by the fact that we modelled the manufacturing of these in India where they've got predominantly a coal grid. So there's certainly a lot more that can do to this prototype and they're currently manufacturing a one kilowatt uh, battery pack to test out um, in rural India where it will be off grid. So in summary, uh, the use phase of batteries in uh, stationary storage is really important to determine the sustainability. The material demand is one of the limiting uh, moves to net zero, and we need to make sure that we conserve our materials, both by ensuring longer lifetimes, reducing the um, criticality of the materials we use, and looking at them at end of life. And I think looking at different architectures does give new opportunities at end of life and for manufacturing. 
I'd just like to say uh, thanks to the team in, in Swansea who supported on this and uh, ISC Bangalore and Sheffield. And thank you very much. Thank you, Jenny. That was great. It was really interesting to hear about. And uh, as with everyone, we're going to follow up on some of these points further in the panel discussion later. Uh, so now I'll introduce our final speaker of the first session, who is uh, Dr. Damika Widanalaj, who's an associate professor at the University of Warwick. Today, he'll be discussing smart battery management, I think. Please go ahead, Damika. Thanks, Andrew. Well, Okay. Um, afternoon, everyone, or morning, wherever you might be joining. Thanks, Andrew, for the introduction. So my name is Damika. Uh, I work as an associate prof here at Warwick, uh, WMG University of Warwick. And um, the session that I'll be presenting is called uh, Smart Battery Management for Sustainable Systems. So what I thought I'll do is um, I've sort of got three key parts I would like to cover to bring out the underpinning concepts of why BMS technology matters in sustainability of electric vehicles. So I'll uh, touch upon that, why, it, uh, why you should consider it. Um, and then spend a bit of time in saying what a smart battery management system is. Uh, and talk about battery life in particular, which is um, where I see much of the value can be brought in, in terms of uh, adding sustainability into uh, electric vehicles once they're deployed. And uh, end with a case study that we recently finished, um, thanks to funding we got from Faraday Institution in collaboration with an industrial partner as well. So that's uh, what I'd like to go through. So perhaps to start off with, um, the um, there are there are mandates that have been put in place um, for EVs, uh, in particular that they have to you know last eight years or at least hundred thousand miles uh, when when purchased by a uh, consumer. But what, what it really means is that uh, within this time, really the capacity of the battery uh, should not fall below 70% of its starting value. Should that happen, then the manufacturers will need to replace the battery packs, and that's uh, quite an expensive uh, activity for them to perform. But to be honest, even you know when we buy a vehicle, we, we don't really think of it just for eight years. We would really like to have it been used for much longer and you know, have several uses, you know, switch hands, with these electric vehicles down the line. So what that means in terms of anticipated scale, I was just looking at the projected growth of EVs here in the UK, and we certainly have a steady growth of number of EVs that enter the UK roads. So in 2023, it was around 270,000. Um, this year, it's predicted to be about uh, 300. Um, and then this is, of course, going to increase uh, over the coming years. Uh, but it, what it means is that you know the, the vehicles that were released eight years ago, so around two, 2016, in principle, are nearing the end of end of life, depending on how they've probably been driven or been used, and will um, either have to go into second use or recycled. Right. And I think this is where BMS or battery management can really play a role to try and extend this usage rather than having to you know, uh, um, rather than um, recycling or putting them to second use, is to try and really prolong this usage case uh, during during deployment. Um, so to do that, I think BMS has a crucial role, and I would like to sort of maybe explain a bit what a battery management system tries to do in this regard. So BMS is a fundamental tech in B uh, electric vehicles. It really manages the uh, full battery pack in terms of uh, safety and et cetera. But there are some key roles it has to do. The first one I would say is to evaluate the range, right? So the, the customer, the driver needs to know how much further they can go um, at any given particular time. And we normally call this state of charge estimation. Um, so the X here means it's not just state of charge. There are other metrics as well, such as state of power and state of health. And these are all crucial to sort of from a experience point of view, these are important metrics. It'll tell you how far we can go, how much power we can extract and how long the vehicles uh, expect to last with SOH, but a bit more on that later. Uh, another important feature is to 
balance these cells. So we, you know, in a, in a battery pack, you could typically have hundreds, if not thousands of cells, depending on the cell format. And it's quite important that these all, you know, are e sort of work in a uniform, homogenized manner. Of course, that's not the case with cell cell variability. There are small changes. And the BMS has to sort of make sure that cells are balanced um, once they're charged before they get depleted or before they've been used. Otherwise, you'll end up with some cells working much harder than the other ones, and you'll have quite an inhomogeneous spread in their health uh, towards the end. Another key aspect is the charging side of things, um, how the batteries are charged. Uh, and one of the key challenging areas, in my view, is that you know these charging profiles have to ideally adapt as the cells age. And again, the, the battery management system has a role to play in that, in how the power is delivered to the battery over the operational lifetime of the, of the vehicle. Uh, moving on, there are two more challenging parts. And I think this is where this, I would call the smart side of things are starting to come in. Uh, another aspect that is quite early on at this point is this technology is trying to evaluate how much life is remaining in, in, the, in the pack. And that question has to be a bit more well-defined, but in principle, it's sort of asking how many more cycles or mileage can this, can this do uh, and how long will it take before it hits 80% or 70% uh, SOH. And another challenging area is to do with safety. And the question sort of asked there is, uh, you know, is it possible for the BMS to detect and identify faulty cells and go a bit further and say what the underpinning faults are and what caused it, right? And ideally, could it, could it sort of preempt faults weeks, days in advance uh, before such an event might happen? So these are some of the key features what a BMS or a, and a smart BMS should achieve, out of which I would say the, the quantities that you see on the right-hand side, the range and cell balancing and some, some aspect of charging is fairly mature. The, the technology is um, quite well understood and there are many companies that, uh, and also I guess in universities that have contributed quite a lot into these algorithms. Uh, but what's coming up at the moment is the quantities that the sort of the value, the, the features that you see on the left hand side that's to do with uh, evaluating the lifetime and the safety. And there's a lot of opportunities here uh, in terms of development, uh, both from uh, for academia and certainly to bring it out into uh, industrial practice. And the way I see it is that um, at the, for this to happen, to bring some of the smartness into it, we, we need to sort of move away from the BMS because some of the computations are heavy for existing battery management systems to handle uh, on board or on the vehicle. And so you need to bring in cloud technologies to, to be able to handle some of this REL remaining useful life for health estimations and things such as fault diagnostics. Uh, so the principle is that you'll, you'll have this uh, technology running on the vehicle. It's got some algorithms. Um, and these algorithms are now starting to utilize more of the physics of the battery that we've understood and simplified such that they could run on an onboard vehicle. Uh, and then these, uh, the, the onboard technology co computes certain states, um, for example, sort of charge, sort of health, but there are some additional advanced states that you can compute, which are useful for some of the, uh, you know, for, for the other advanced features such as lifetime prediction for detections. So if, if you can then transfer this across to a cloud infrastructure where there's much more, you know, there's no limitations on the uh, computing infrastructure, you could run much more high fidelity models there to evaluate some of these uh, quantities and then sort of do some corrective measures, uh, either indicate the user that a fault is about to happen or manage how the charging is done by suggesting, you know, you're doing this many fast charges, perhaps reduce it to this many fast charges per week if you want to extend the, the life and the sustainability of the vehicle. So there are some corrective measures that can be done and that can be fed back. So you know we normally call this over-the-air updates, for example. So that's um, that's the way, the way I see things are moving to it at the moment. We, there's a bit of, quite a bit of coupling between a lot of tech on the vehicle, but given their limitations, uh, we're, we're starting to utilize more of data analytics and physics um, with cloud infrastructure to get some of these advanced features and make the battery uh, management system a lot smarter. 
So with that said, I'm going to focus on one aspect uh, going forward, which is on battery life. So it's called the remaining useful life problem. Uh, so what I would like to do is to show some example data sets that we've gathered here at Warwick. So this is a high energy cell, uh, the LGM50 cell. And what you see on the vertical axis is the uh, normalized capacity as a function of the, uh, the, the charge, the work it's done is a discharge throughput. We can, of course, with some assumption, convert this discharge throughput to a mileage, you know, assume a certain number of cells in a pack and a vehicle efficiency, and you can sort of convert this to a mileage equivalent. But we are showing this as a function of amp power. So what you're seeing is, uh, you know, some example capacity fades achieved at 10 degrees Celsius. Uh, we have a slow discharge of 0.3 C, and then sort of a, a moderate discharge of 1 C. And interestingly, when we increase the discharge to 2C, you would expect the yellow curve to be lower, but maybe for another time and another session, we're seeing the, the fast discharge to be aging much slower than the, the slow 1C discharge. Uh, but then if you move to the charging, uh, and, and sorry, and if you increase the discharge at lower temperatures, it starts off well, and then you get what's called this knee point effect, where things start to collapse very quickly. And this is quite a this is definitely a scenario you want to avoid or be able to preempt when this might happen. And if you similarly do fast charging at low temperatures, for example, 10 degrees, things get even worse. Uh, and it's often recommended not to do fast charging at low temperatures. Right, so this is um, quite characteristic sort of curve that you might see from labs when you, when you do battery aging tests. This is an example where we conducted this for a year and a half or almost two years. And here, this is the typical sort of curve that you might get. So with this in place, what people try to do is they, they try and you know, get hold of, I, I want to say what the battery health is, uh, you know, what, what the lifetime could be. And the way I see is there are three approaches you might take to this. So the question is, I want to understand how long it might take to, to reach uh, this 80% threshold, right? So, um, and the way, one way to do this is to say, let's look at, some features in the initial part of the cycles. For example, you know, give me the first 100 cycles, I'll extract some features, and I'll tell you how long it'll take to get to 80% uh, based on another kind of a cycle, right? So this, this, this kind of a problem definition is useful when you're doing battery manufacturing, where you want to evaluate you know, the, the design choices that you make at quite early on, uh, and to understand, you know, based on a few cycles, will the electrochemical performance uh, remain uh, for, the, for this cell? So this, there, there certainly is a use for such a problem definition. But when it comes to vehicles and predicting life of vehicles, this is not very beneficial. It is somewhat restricted to the usage being the same uh, down the line, which is not the case when you deploy electric vehicles. So another way to think of it is that, okay, let me, you know, rather than trying to predict the number of cycles, let's try and predict the capacity C over a few steps ahead. So the similar problem definition is that I'm going to try and get some features based on the first 100 cycles, and I'm going to tell what the capacity is at TKR plus R, some R steps ahead, right? And if I could train my model in that way, I can get the features further down the line, and I can tell what the capacity is going to be next month or you know the, the following month afterwards, whatever R might be. So this is sort of a, a moving horizon problem. You try and define what the capacity might be for the next uh, couple of weeks. Uh, it's also got some, some benefit. This, this kind of models can be done with you know, purely data-driven approaches. You don't need much physics for this. And it certainly can be embedded on a battery management system as well. However, for to really exploit um, and extend the sustainability of, of a battery, what we would really like to do is to say, well, let's look at the driving behavior, right? Rather than some arbitrary features, we're really interested in how the, the what the current and the temperature profile is or the operational conditions that the battery is subjected to, right? And the corresponding voltage response in the capacity. And we want to look at those time responses and to be able to say, to use that as the training for a model and then say, okay, if, if I know how the vehicle is going to be driven, I can then say how the capacity is going to be for any other driving pattern. And that's, that's really a very uh, powerful model in my view. If you can you know, generalize it and say, irrespective of the way you drive and the operating conditions, we've now got a handle on how the underpinning capacity trajectory is going to be. 
Right. So, so for this, um, you need to really constrain the models. It can't be heavily data driven because um, you want more generalizability. Uh, and this is where most of the physics comes in. And um, it's sort of what also we've, we've been doing uh, the last sort of year and a half, um, thanks to a project funded through the Friday Institution. So I would like to briefly touch upon that and then sort of uh, bring it to bring it to an end. So this is on this problem type three, where we're saying, I, I would like to know what the capacity is, but rather than looking at features, we want to understand it for a given usage case and bring in the underpinning physics for it. So this pro the project is called Wiper. It was called Validate an Integrated Platform for Battery Remaining Useful Life. This was together with a company here in the Midlands called Airtron Technologies. They're a startup company um, who are uh, based in UK and in Turkey, and they, they make BMS technologies uh, specifically for this problem uh, to, with the hardware and, and a cloud infrastructure. And um, from Warwick, our, our task was to get some of these physics-based models that were running fairly well on our desktop environments into their production version of their BMS technologies. This wasn't an easy task. The numerical schemes had to be thought of, the models had to be simplified without really compromising much of the physics so that we can maintain some of this predictability. Um, and there's still a lot to be done there, in my view. Uh, but that that's one of the key things we wanted to make sure. We wanted to make sure that the, the, the physics-based models would run on their battery management technology. And then similarly, we would have a copy of that model on their cloud. And the idea is that as the vehicle drives, it does some computations, it calculates some states, some uh, physical states, and it transfers that across uh, to the cloud model. Right? And on once, they, once we get this information onto the cloud, you can initialize it, say, here's the initial conditions. And now we could emulate a, a variety of scenarios. We could say, okay, here's my starting point of the battery. I'm going to assume a light user, a very uh, aggressive kind of dri driving pattern, or any mixed kind of behavior and evaluate various scenarios and sort of evaluate how long will the battery last given the corresponding, given the current state with uh, various driving patterns, right? And that's sort of the question you, you want to find out the remaining is for life. And that's quite a heavy computation and that it makes sense to do that on sort of a cloud infrastructure. And with that information, you could also bring some corrective measures back. I put this in dotted line. This wasn't part of the scope for us in this project, but certainly we can close the loop once uh, you sort of have a handle on how long the battery is going to last. So here's a, an example of these driving profiles we, we designed here in our labs and then exercise the cells with. So you typically what you do is this is five and a half day uh, profile. And so we design a power profile. There are two, we said, let's assume a fairly light user sort of commuting to work and then back and sort of more of a taxi fleet kind of a user case where there's much more heavy depth of discharge. If you look at the voltage responses, one of them, you know, the, the first, the one on the left doesn't really fully deplete the cell, whereas the other one does a lot, much higher depth of discharge. And also we, we brought in quite a few fast charging for, for, the, for the heavy user compared to the, uh, the light user. So this is an example that we used with this exercise of cells. And then uh, we want to evaluate how the capacity fed uh, would, 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 would be. So we tried this idea, we, we developed the models, we shared it with the company. Um, and then we, we similarly had a much more high fidelity model running on the cloud. Uh, but what is interesting was that these states, you know, these are not sort of your capacity states. These are, these are states related to things such as SCI growth, porosity change. So these are, Certain, you know, the, the aging mechanisms that we are confident that we, are com we know how to model. I mean, there are many more that, that can go wrong with cells, uh, but we're still not very com confident how to model them properly. Um, but based on the patterns we're seeing, we were, we were confident with certain aging mechanisms and we modeled that. And the state XN that you're seeing here sort of summarizes the key aging states that the battery is at any given point. So what we did was we said, okay, let's assume the, the vehicle drives for three weeks. We get the state after three weeks that gets uh, transferred across the cloud. In the cloud, you would then simulate various scenarios um, by initializing it for that state. So the, the cloud model accepts that state and we forward simulate various trajectories. For example, the two I showed you, the, the light user and the heavy user. 
and then we can evaluate how long will it will it uh, how many more cycles or what the capacity trajectory will be like. So we did this over sort of nine different conditions. I'm not going to show all those nine, but just to give a summary, we sort of obtained about 98, 94 percent accuracy in predicting the the future prediction of the capacity fade uh, over two different temperatures. Uh, and for sort of constant current type signals, this is very typical in lab, you would do CCCB charging, CC discharge. But we also really wanted to exercise these models with this drive cycle, this mixed sort of calendar aging and uh, power profile kind of a scenario. And even for those cases with this mixed calendar driving, we, we got fairly, fairly decent accuracies um, at this point. This, this is quite a nice outcome, but I think there's uh, plenty more uh, to do in my view. Having, having gone through this task. So for example, to achieve this kind of, um, for this to work or this kind of performance, we had to age the cells for about 10 weeks. Uh, and this is predominantly to calibrate the model. So these models have a certain number of parameters, these physics based models. So we need to calibrate the electrochemical dynamics and the aging dynamics. Of the two, the aging dynamics are quite slow. So it, it you know, there's, there's a fundamental limitation. You can't do a one hour experiment and then sort of extract aging parameters. You got to do weeks of sort of experiments to, to see how the dynamics of aging manifest, right? So for us, it, it was about 10 weeks by the time we, we sort of got a handle on some of these parameters. Um, and then, but that calibration also is not a, not a trivial task. It, there's, 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 I think there's a lot more work to be done there and how we design these experiments and how we calibrate these models. But afterwards, you know, we, we, we then forward simulated for 30 weeks plus, and that's where we got these sort of levels of accuracies. Ideally, I think if you could bring it down to four weeks, I think it's going to be quite practical and I think a nice achievement, but we're not quite there yet. Um, so I think, yeah, there's plenty more work to be done in terms of this experimental design, certainly in you know, sort of universities and lab-based settings. Um, and once they're deployed, I think there's more work in terms of field uh, data acquisition and recalibration. Uh, that's also quite an interesting and challenging sort of topic in my view. Um, and the way I see it is that, you know, looking at battery management technology, there's definitely an uptake of more of these physics-based models, which is a, a very good sign. And uh, working with, you know, these commercial organizations, uh, it's, it's quite nice to see getting these physics-based models actually running on production level uh, battery management systems. It's quite early stage in my view um, because um, there's quite a few more fundamental challenges that we need to address uh, in terms of estimating this X, the state X I, I showed earlier, there's uh, more work to be done there. But I think when, uh, when these advances happen, I think there's considerable value that the smart BMSs will bring about to sustaining sustainable EVs. All right, so with that, I would like to um, sort of sh conclude with the key acknowledgements that this work was done by, uh, with a nice team here at Warwick, Farhan, Mingzhao, Jishnu, my PhD student, and Nessa, uh, and a fantastic team of en engineers from Atron Technologies and uh, the funding from the Farad Institute. So, thank you very much. Great, thank you so much again, Damika. It was a really interesting talk. And, yeah, I can't wait to hear some more about it in the panel discussion that we've got coming up now. So just before we go on to that, I just want to thank all of our speakers for this first session again, sharing their really exciting insights and research with us. Uh, at this stage, we'll start our panel discussion. So I'd like to invite all of the speakers to turn on their cameras and microphones and we'll get started. So I will start out with a question for Magda maybe. So, uh, you know, you gave a really, really nice overview of how many different factors and the variety of different things that need to be considered towards sustainability of batteries. I wonder if you could maybe comment on where you see the priority areas being or the uh, the challenges that the community need to focus on in the first instance, uh, moving towards sustainability of these systems. Oh, that's, that's a very difficult question because I think we need to, we need to address all the life stages of a battery life. Um, they're all equally important. Um, so I guess from my personal interest, but not because this is the most important part, I would say 
try to eliminate critical materials as much as possible. But of course, as everything in life, it comes to a call to a balance because if we eliminate completely critical metals, the performance may not be as good as as the other. So, so I think Professor Yanyao gave a very nice example on how we can do that potentially with the solid state batteries and so on. But, but yeah, it's never it's never as sweet as we would like to be. Um, another thing that I I I see is try really to manufacture these batteries better. Try to eliminate all these nasty components that we are currently using in in their manufacturing. Um, very bad binders and and very bad solvents. Um, and I know there are a lot of research activities in trying to make dry electrodes or, or trying to optimize the architecture of these electrodes. I think all of these are important. And I guess, of course, as we move to all these new battery chemistries that are potentially more sustainable, we still have a lot to understand on the fundamental level. How do their interfaces form? And I'm talking not only interfaces between the electrolyte and the active material, but also between the active material and the current collector. Um, it's all very complex. Um, and yeah, think about the end of life really. Um, and how we can make recycling methods more sustainable and, and a bit more 21st century. Uh, thanks. I think that's a great answer. I'm sorry for putting you on the spot there with a tough question to start out with. No, I, I think. Uh, sorry. I I think the I want to say that you know it requires really interdisciplinary efforts, and we all have to work together towards that more sustainable battery. I think one sort of thing that you've begun to touch upon there that maybe uh, Jenny would like to sort of expand a bit further on is sort of identifying some of the, the key battery components that represent the, the biggest challenges of, at the moment and the most obvious path towards attaining a circular economy and better recycling of manufacturer batteries in the future? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question because actually if you look at, say, NMC 811 or 111 even, where you've got plenty of cobalt in that material and plenty of nickel, and um, there's an advantage to look at recycling it. And as Magda says, the sort of last century recycling methods are all about getting the value of the elements out. I think what we need to look at is how can we get the value of the component, as, as you say, in the battery out, which they're the um, complex materials that you're you're making during your manufacturing route or if you're formulating NMC or LFP, that's got more value than those elements on their own, particularly when you get rid of the nickel and the cobalt and you're looking at the lower cost compounds, then really it's the work done to make those materials to make sure that they've got the right um, morphology and that they're working right as a battery, that if you destroy all of that and just get the elements, if you look at a sodium ion battery, all you're left with is, you know, nothing of value really. You know, you've got sodium, uh, you've got carbon, you've got nitrogen, and, and that's not in, the value is in that as a battery. So I think that's where there is some interest. I do think that flow batteries have got a lot of interest in terms of how they will behave at end of life and how we can manage them at end of life. They've got very long lifetimes and they've got, you know, big tanks of electrolyte with the vanadium flow batteries where it's all kept there sort of together. But that still leaves us with an electric vehicle problem. So it, it's there's no one answer to it. And I think the biggest thing will be how do we get at those batteries without having to shred them? And, and I think Magda alluded to some of those items in, you know, in her talk. But I think a lot of it also is who's manufacturing these and where are they end of life? That's the big elephant in the room. And, and what influence do we have on the manufacturing? But also China are making faster steps in here than many, uh, you know, some of the stuff in in Europe. So 
that development is happening of how you can make sure those batteries and the cells are accessible at end of life. Makes sense. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, maybe changing tack slightly, uh, got a question for Jan. Maybe you could uh, discuss what some of the advantages and challenges are of solid state uh, versus non aqueous electrolytes in these batteries. Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. Um, so, <clears throat> Yeah, currently all the lithium ion batteries are non aqueous batteries that give you a higher voltage. Um, you know, potential solid state based batteries um, you know, can give you a higher energy density by using you know, lithium or sodium metal and potential safer. Um, but you know, currently solid state batteries do have some challenges for large scale you know, production. Uh, one of them is the pressure, the stacking pressure uh, required. And uh, um, you know, because you know the solid solid contact to maintain good contact during charge to charge, uh, you know, is still required by applying some higher pressure, probably ten times at least ten times more than what we are applying to uh, liquid non aqueous based uh, systems. Um, so yeah, so that and also the cost, you know, and the yield. Uh, manufacturing these doable small cells, you know, uh, one amp power cell probably can be uh, done and operated. But scaling and the reasonable cost is uh, one of the key challenges. Um, so, but also, you know, relating to my talk on um, organic based uh, cathode material and the sodium systems, I think uh, this community, relatively small community, um, in the past, people mainly focus on the material level study, new materials, and focus more on material level and density. I think to have more impact, really, we need to start to <clears throat> do more on the cell level understanding, right? Uh, because that's, uh, you know, that's important, you know, to present cell level understanding. And a lot of new science need to be discovered because, uh, for example, what we realized, you know, the electrolyte amount, you know, is, is an inactive component, but actually pretty, quite critical when you, you know, design, scale up new battery systems. Uh, you actually spend, uh, you know, typically like 10 to 15% weight electrolyte, but in some battery systems, you require about 50%. Right? This relates to the microstructure, engineering, how do you calendar, you know, how do you, what type of carbon you use. So I think that's uh, still, you know, to really make a practical, you know, for new uh, non listening and based system, uh, you know, looking to the, there's so many opportunities both fundamental scientific understanding and uh, you know, manufacturing related and, you know, aspects and engineering problem have been tackled. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Uh, again, changing to tax slightly, you know, digital twins seem to be a more popular area in, in many different uh, aspects of energy and materials research generally at the moment. I, uh, you know, I think both uh, Franco and Damico, you've sort of touched upon different elements of that in your uh, in your talks. I wondered if, uh, you know, maybe starting with Franco, but I'd love to hear both of your thoughts on sort of where we are at the moment, where the sort of current status of being able to implement digital twins in battery systems and uh, how you see the sort of future of development of uh, digital twins being used across the sort of whole range of batteries from, you know, their uh, operation, the uh, optimization in the manufacturing process, all the way through to sort of end of life and life cycle. So yeah, maybe Franco, if you want to get started. Yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, an important distinction here is to a subtle distinction is the the digital twin of the process of manufacturing and the digital twin of the of the product, right? And uh, Damico was speaking very precisely about the digital twin of the product. This is the, the typical case of the battery managing management systems. And uh, of course, this is, uh, as far as I understand, the industry is trying to apply this as soon as possible to, to ramp up production because of uh, demand, basically. But uh, as you have seen, what I have shown is uh, proofs of concept, right? This is not uh, really integrated. What I have shown, at least, is not really integrated into a real pilot line, but the, the ultimate goal that I see is this integration and this uh, back and forth loop. Uh, a problem with the with machine learnings and uh, models that are integrated in digital twins is that they can only be good as good as the data that you input, right? So, so this feedback 
the sensor that feed from the, the, the real world data into the digital twin need to be integrated in order to improve the, the, the model as it goes. And uh, I see this as a, as a next step, which I, I would la really like to see implemented uh, soon, right? Uh, um, I, I was talking about the digital twin of the product. Um, uh, I think it would be good also to include the digital twin of the product during the manufacturing itself. So we, you can also start to optimize for long, uh, long life cycles, for example, as you manufacturing, assuming certain conditions for, for the future use of the battery, and so on, with a battery management system in there already. Right. Thanks, Frank. Maybe that's a nice segue then into Damaka sharing a few thoughts there as well. Yeah, sure. Um, exactly. I think, like Frank mentioned, there is a strong demand right now uh, to understand the performance of vehicles once they're deployed. And there's a lot of data analytics coming in. Um, and that's you using digital twins. But in my view, to really for a digital twin to be a lot more effective, uh, it has to be a mix of the data-driven method and of the underpinning physics, let's say, or the mechanism to be coupled. The reason is that the reason we, we want to move into a more higher computationally, you know, uh, superior sort of platform, but then we want to, if you're not making use of the predictive aspects, we're sort of not maximizing its value. But for things to be predictive, we also need to have the right constraints of the models running on the platforms. Um, the reason is if, if we can achieve those predictiveness with confidence, we can make better decisions as to what can be controlled, whatever we can control to extend the sustainability of these devices. Right? We, could, we could ask more challenging questions on how should it be used such that we know these constraints are going to happen. And I think that's that's where I think the moving, it's sort of really machine learning is very well mature. There's a lot of techniques and that's being used at the moment. If it, many startups as well. But the way I see it is that the trend is going to be as the physics develops as well from more fundamental understanding, that's going to make its way into these digital twins as well more and more. And then we're going to have uh, much more, I guess, meaningful sort of questions that could be asked um, from these digital twin campaigns and sort of hopefully get a more valuable feedback mechanism. Great, yeah, thanks for sharing. Uh Moving tact again slightly, maybe going back to Magda, you know, I, I realize you ran out of time a little bit, but you started sort of touching upon uh, the different sort of carbon electrode chemistries that you've been working on in, in your group. Uh, maybe you could comment on sort of the feasibility of uh, carbon electrode chemistry and commercial battery applications beyond graphite and what some of those sustainable ways to make carbon electrodes are when we take into account sort of the carbon sources that uh, you're using. Well, so I think carbon is used everywhere in a battery, not only as an active material. Well, for lithium ion batteries, graphite, I guess for sodium ion battery, it will be hard carbon, but then also as a, as a conductive additive, people tend to use carbon black. Um, the binder has carbon as well. Lots of things have carbons. And I guess in general, for our future materials and chemicals, we really need to think about green carbon sources. And I guess green carbon sources are of three kinds, bio-derived, plastic waste-derived, and CO2-derived. So potentially, yes, we could make synthetic graphite for lithium-ion batteries from some precursors, but those will have to be aromatic and it's actually quite expensive um, because it's very energy consumption. So I think life cycle assessments show that despite the criticality of graphite, probably making synthetic graphite is, is more energy consuming, but that will depend on the geopolitical factors because I think we have a lot of graphite. It's just a question of where it is and how we can trade it and how pure it is. We've also made some studies with hard carbons for lithium and potassium ion batteries. And, you know, 
they're they're not as great as graphite for for those type of chemistries. I mean, we've started. I don't want to bore you with the details. We published a paper on potassium versus lithium versus sodium in in graphite with different graphitization domains, different layer structures, and and yeah, nothing beats graphite when it comes to lithium and potassium. Um, for sodium, yeah, there is hot carbon and. And I guess the challenge is finding the most sustainable source, but also maximizing performance. In terms of the additives and replacing the carbon black, there are a lot of research activities these days turning CO2 into carbon. So CO2 reduction is a very complex process, particularly if you want to target a particular chemical, ethylene or methanol, but you could reduce it all the way to carbon this might be a good source of mitigating CO2 emissions and converting it into material that could be potentially useful in batteries instead of this carbon black. But these are all very future directions, I guess. And yeah, carbon in binders, um, let's try to use more re, um, binders that are made more from, from renewable polymers rather than PVDF. And there's carbon in the electrolytes as well, of course. Uh, and and those have to be greener too. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, there's lots of challenges and lots of work still to be done, for sure. Uh, following that up a little bit to some extent, uh, another question for Jan. Uh, could you comment on sort of what you feel like the feasibility of other sort of macro structures are? So things like COPs and MOFs being used in battery applications. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, you know, yeah, we just you know, need to understand the different TIL level, right? Uh, you know, for this kind battery, it's a very mature system. Uh, you know, it's produced uh, in a gigawatt scale. Uh, for some of the new battery you know, system we're talking about, we still have a rather low TIL level. Um, so, yeah, cough moth, you know, it's one of them. Uh, those probably, you know, low level three, two. Um, some of these materials, you know, yeah, um, they have, uh, you know, better stability, you know, cycling stability, it do not dissolve in the electron line, right? Because it's more like polymer. Uh, uh, and uh, so they have some uh, you know, ion connectivity despite design. So improve some ion connectivity, optimize transport, the pore size. So I think that one of the you know, challenges the to be practical and manufacturing large scale into address you know, one of is the volumetric uh, properties, uh, volumetric capacity, because some of the poor materials, right? The volumetric is a pretty low density. Um, so, and uh, second is uh, connectivity, electronic connectivity. Um, as I mentioned, converting from material level to cell level, we need to reach you know, fraction in the composite, at least, you know, comparable listening inorganic is 95%. So, uh, but currently most of the systems require, you know, 30%, 20% carbon. Uh, can you develop uh, electronic conductive, uh, any conductive morph cough? I think there's some uh, promising work being done in this field. In this case, they can demonstrate even you know, less than 1% carbon or you know, almost no carbon. So by intrinsic electronic connectivity, I think that's a important direction. Um, so um, yeah, that's number one to make it more conductive. Um, second is that, you know, how do you uh, scale up this at relevant low, you know, low cost, right? So <laughs> uh, abundant material doesn't mean it's uh, intrinsic low cost. You know, there's still a lot of uh, challenges to fabricate uh, scale up at uh, low cost. And uh, a third one is I, I just mentioned the electrolyte amount. Those are intrinsic, you know, uh, is in active component, you know, uh, in the listening line batteries um, uh, design is typical less than 15% by weight. Uh, with the poor materials, more porous materials, uh, potentially you will have use more electrolyte. And that will decrease your cell level and your density. So being have a smart design of um, you know uh, the the porosity control at the electrical level and the cell level would uh, be important. You know to really 
demonstrate to the advantage of the new type of the materials. Yeah, yeah that's good. Question. Thank you. Uh, just in the interest of time, I'll move on, try and get a couple of more questions in before we have time for a break. So uh, another question maybe for Jenny is uh, thinking about the, you know, these large area and large scale batteries for long term energy storage. What, what are the differences between the considerations of uh, making those sorts of processes more sustainable than, say, in the small scale batteries? And so there's a slight follow up in advance. Like, do you see a pathway for uh, retired EV batteries being used in the future? It's, part of a solution to long-term storage? Yeah, so that's an interesting question. I mean, in some cases, in terms of cell manufacture, that will be the same and that they can be destined either for um, grid-scale storage or EV storage. Obviously, the pack manufacturer will be different and how you want to manage the battery management system and how you're looking at your charge discharge rates and, and that side of it. So it's probably the battery management that is more different because you've got more control over it in, in a way. So obviously an EV accelerating is going to increase the discharge rate and you're not going to tell somebody they can't accelerate because you don't want to ruin your battery, whereas that might be a cost calculation. So you want to do that cost versus lifetime calculation. At the moment, we don't do that. And I think that's where we will come into, um, it, you know, in the future when we've got those models and, and the work uh, that's happening in Warwick. I think that, that sort of thing will help people manage their batteries um, better with grid scale. In terms of looking at second life, this is a good question. And we see it also in solar PV where you may have a, a solar farm that's being re um getting new panels put on it because the new panels are more efficient and they can work better than the old panels even though the old panels still work which is effectively what you're, you're saying would happen at the end of life with batteries and the key question is how do you certify that end of life battery to make sure that you know it's still got some life left in it what is the cost of that recertification and what's also the cost of the person to install the battery, the inverters, the battery management system, because if all of that additional is worth proportionally more than the battery that you're getting at the end of its life, then you then question, do you want to take that risk of into your building, not putting a new battery, but putting a second life battery in when you've got all of those additional things? So I think that's something that it will be a risk cost balance that will happen and it will really depend on the auxiliary costs around installing that battery. How far are you having to transport it? Does the vehicle drive right up to the, the battery? Is it taken out somewhere else or in another country? So you need to include those financial and you know environmental costs of that shipping. Um, and I think there's also another thing that if that a second life, I mean, at the moment, vehicles are the, the warranty to eight years. Many are staying on the roads much, much longer than that. And therefore, has the battery chemistry changed such as you've got a load of valuable cobalt in there from 2017 chemistry? And actually, in maybe 2030, 2035, we say, well, we don't want that cobalt in a second life battery. We want it out doing something more important. So... I think there's a lot of considerations with Second Life. And the final thing I'd say on that is that an EV battery can help support the grid long before it leaves the car. And I think that's another important area. So firstly, time charging to make sure that you're charging at a sensible time to support the grid when there's excess renewables. And there's already many technologies uh, on the market already for people to plug their vehicle in and get it charged at a lower rate of electricity cost. Then there's vehicle to grid, which is a lot more complex. And um, that's uh, outside of, of my remit of, of work, but where that battery can help, especially people who have low mileages, particularly at the end of the life, it might have a sort of second life still in the vehicle. Somebody who only drives a few thousand miles a year who wants a vehicle that's sort of plugged in all the time to actually be be doing that operation without it leaving the car. So it's a complex question and I, I think there'll be many answers to it. Yeah, thanks, Jenny. 
Uh, we're running a little bit behind, so apologies from my side for some poor moderating, maybe we'll say. I, I'll have uh, one final question that I'll sort of wrap in both to Franco and Danica again. You know, I think uh, using AI, machine learning, and digital twins to resolve lots of these problems is a really promising area. I guess uh, a quick question to both of you is what the community can be doing better to aid that. You know, I think uh, there's always questions about uh, the standardization, standardization of reported data across sort of the literature. And maybe you could just both comment on what the community could be doing better to uh, invigorate the uh, machine learning and digital twin age of uh, research. So, uh, yes, definitely standardization of, of data, both from experiments and, and if you are running a physics based simulations, uh, this data also needs uh, to standardize and we have not really seen any kind of standard for reporting this. Uh, so this would be a, a great idea. Um, and also on the other side, on the, on the side of more of uh, the control of the physical system, the integration of, of actuators with uh, of the, the equipment and uh, the robotization of the of the manufacturing process in terms of pilot plants and uh, manufacturing plants, but also potentially at the at the research level, at the lab level. Uh, if you can, if you can have a machine that can be controlled by a, an API on on additionally additionally to a to a manual control. Uh, this is already a step towards this uh, this goal of this full loop between them. That's right. Yeah, I could add um, as well to that. Um, I, I think given that these are you know these AI machine learning techniques are very power data hungry methods. Certainly, what we as a community can do is to aid in the data sharing process. Often, you know, these data just sits in our labs once the experiment's done, once the project's finished. That's it. If that's the end of that fate of the data just lives there, right? And I think there's a lot more benefit if we can somehow make it open access data sets, not just the you know, the code base, which is which is good. Uh, so I think that's definitely something we can do a lot more, certainly the universities. Um, and and um, I think that's something personally I'm trying to push as well, but that still only gets us up to a certain point because these are lab grade experiments. They're nice and clean, done under certain controlled operations. If we could also get industries to somehow share data sets, you know, with certain um, practices in place, I think that's really going to boost this place, uh, this community up. I think I think it is possible because you know, there's some data doesn't necessarily have personal information stored in them. So it, you know, I think I'm sure there are ways around it. If we can get companies to, because they certainly will be tracking once the vehicles are deployed and they will have access to it. Uh, so I think. There's, com there's communication required between governments, universities, and industry, how we could also have access to such data from commercial vehicles or fleets if, you know, uh, in the future, I think. Makes sense, yeah, lots of food for thought there. So, I mean, I, firstly, apologies to everyone for overrunning slightly, but firstly, I just wanted to say that uh, we've come to the end of the first session and we'd really like to thank all of our speakers again. So Magda Titorici, Yan Yao, Franco Zanotto, Jenny Baker and Danica Widanala, given some really inspiring and engaging presentations and discussion there. And uh, I think it's been a really great session so far.